Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we've been talking about Egypt, and now we're going to talk about what happened after the Israelites left Egypt. Um, we discussed briefly sort of the archaeological record associated with the Exodus and how that is kind of the linchpin of all ancient history chronology. Uh, we are now going to proceed to an event that changed the world in the form of giving us a book that changed the world. Obviously, what we are talking about here is the journey to Mount Sinai by the Israelites crossing the Red Sea and then actually coming there uh, to the same mountain where Moses first had the revelation of God and his name back in chapter three, uh, which was then called Mount Hor. But it's the same place that we come to. And again, God is now going to reveal himself to all of his people uh, by a mega sound system where <laughs> a couple million people can hear him speak to them, but their response is, uh, can Moses please go talk to him for us? <laughs> <laughs> this is too scary. Mm -hmm. By the way, scary. it blew my mind when I found out that Mount Horeb was the same as Mount Sinai. I did not grow up knowing that at all. Oh. Never, never was mentioned. <laughs> well, or yeah, that you later have Elijah go to the same mountain too. Mm -hmm. uh, that it keeps, <laughs> it keeps showing up as the mountain of God and the place where the Lord reveals his name particularly, um, which is the important thing as we come to Mount Sinai, because the Lord is going to speak about himself as the deliverer, um, but in particularly continue to reveal himself in his covenant name of Jehovah mm -hmm. or Yahweh, uh, which is something we don't see as much in Genesis. It's Exodus where we really get that. And the Lord is going to declare his name in all of its detail to Moses as he passes him by. Um, but particularly we change the world because we're learning more about this covenant God. Also because he shows himself in his character by giving two sets of 10 commandments, which are not simply rules because they're good ideas, but rather they're the expression of who God is and his mm -hmm. character. And they're not simply spoken what is now going to really distinguish Israel from all other nations and religions is God writes them down himself with his own hand that then sets the example for Moses to write his five books and so on so that we will be a religion of the book of the written word and not simply oral traditions or poems that are recited, any of those types of things you find in other religions. To what extent do you think Moses could have understood how deeply the world would be changed by this event? How much does anyone understand a technological information shift like the printing press or the telegraph or the cell phone? Oh, it's no big deal. People won't do much with this. Really, mom, dad, it's not, everybody has one, but it's not like it's a big deal. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, this, this <laughs> past week I was talking with a lady and she was telling me the stories of her husband getting his first computer in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And her comment was, this is a passing fad. He doesn't need a computer to write a sermon. Jonathan Edwards wrote perfectly good sermons <laughs> with no computers. He doesn't need this. Of course, somebody then pointed out she was loading her dishwasher. Um, <laughs> but there's so many things like the computers in the 80s that come out and most people just kind of go, eh, that, okay, nobody's going to ever use that. But I think we don't know the meaning of technology often until it's been around for a while. So we're talking about a technological shift here then. And, and a cultural shift. And a cultural shift and a philosophical theological shift. Uh, as Rachel said, The what's new here is that unlike all the other religions of the world, God is speaking to his people, not only in words that can be heard in, in normal language, normal syntax, but then can be written out alphabetically, phonetically, and preserved in a book, a single book, for generations and generations after that, to a thousand generations. No other religion had this. And in fact, as we come to the Ten Commandments, and I hope to look at each of them in turn, 
we'll see that the second commandment enshrines this as, uh, yeah, you're not going to be going over and looking at idols and pictures and images and bowing to them and fixating on them and staring at them or, as Ezekiel says, doting on them. <laughs> you're going to read words that I have preserved for you, having myself spoken them or inspired one of my prophets to write. This is huge. This is a new way of thinking about God. The first commandment enshrines God as the only God, and there are no other gods and there are no other competitors. Uh, and he, from Genesis 1 forward, is spirit. He doesn't, and does not have a body like a man. He, um, he's transcendent, he's invisible, he's uh, intangible. And if we want to talk to him or interact with him, we need words. And he has chosen to use words to reach out and touch us. This is revolutionary both for how we think about God and religion uh, and how we communicate about God and religion. And since religion is at the heart of any culture, that sets the tone for the whole culture. Mm -hmm. We're going to be a people who have books and who write things out and communicate with words that have it, that, that it consist in terms of grammar and um, tenses and uh, moods and uh, all the rest of that. The, the, the ancient world had words about gods. They just didn't mean anything. They were, <laughs> they were gibberish. Um, or they were only for the elite. No, they were for uh, the elite. The priests, yeah. those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. Magic no. words. Magic words. Yeah, they were, yeah, yeah. For it was more like spells and incantations, not stories and mm -hmm. clear commandments of do and don't. Or, How comforting is that, that the Lord has spoken to us with words. And so as we want to reach him, we don't have to follow mystical actions and hope they're interpreted correctly, hoping mm. we're doing them correctly. We know that God understands language because he's spoken to us in language. So he will hear us. And yet the irony is so often, at least we see in our generation, a seeking after those experiences mm -hmm. because it seems too simple, too straightforward. We want things to do. Um, we want things to yeah. feel. Yes. Experience. Experience. And, you know, the, the, the one thing you didn't mention is reading is hard work. Mm -hmm. It is. As any of our students will tell you. I don't like to read. Why? Now, I, I am sympathetic a little. To anyone says they don't like to read. I can understand. There's a lot of things I don't like to do, too. And some of them are very good, profitable things I don't like to do. But when your God has spoken to you in words and has said, hear the word of the Lord, it rather behooves you to learn how to pursue that communication process, mm -hmm. um, which means you got to learn to read. And not and reading doesn't mean simply knowing that if I have these particular phonograms in this particular order, I am to sound them out so that they sound like this, the cat set on the mat. Okay, who is this cat? Why is he sitting on a mat? What is a mat? <laughs> What's Matt doing on the ground anyway? Um, Intrigue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we, uh, and reading becomes more than decoding. It becomes mm -hmm. a, this thing we call literature. It becomes an art form where we have to learn how to connect words that we've received before with the words we're coming to now. And that process and yeah. should uh, should be done even if you're hearing rather than mm. looking at a page. Yeah. Uh, God doesn't exactly say in the Old Testament, read the word of the Lord very often. He says, hear the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want us to look down on the process of audio Bibles or audio books as long as it's that active engagement, that active yeah. seeking to understand the communication. Yeah, because either reading or listening can become purely uh, automatic, yeah, ritual, passive. passive, where I, mm -hmm. I sat here and the preacher said something and I am done. I heard a sermon. Uh, and the, one, of, one of our presidents went to hear a sermon and the reporter grabbed him on the way out and said, what, what did the preacher talk about? He said, he talked about sin. What did he say about it? He said he was against it. <laughs> 
safe guess. I don't think he was listening, though. <laughs> Doesn't sound like it, does it? Or he just didn't want to talk to reporters. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, read, reading or listening. And, and, and th this is, you point out something I point out to my students often. You're, there aren't many commands to read the Bible for a real simple reason. <laughs> uh, for the first 5,500 years of human history, most people didn't have Bibles to read. Mm -hmm. uh, they were expensive. They were written out by hand. You could have bits and pieces. But until the invention of movable type, about 1450, two, three, four, five, depending on who you believe, or what exactly you consider invention, you, you, you did, most people, unless you were really, really wealthy or you were a church, didn't have Bibles. And so they went to church and they listened to the Bible read out loud, and they tried to remember what they heard, and then they sang scripture, particularly the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And that was a great way to commemorate God's word to memory. But there was, a, there was a lot of emphasis upon listening well, remembering, and putting pieces together. So it, although it's not what we think of necessarily as literary, the man bringing the sermon has got to deal with the written text, and he's got to explicate it in a way that we see how the literature, the literary elements are coming together to communicate more than we might have thought at a first glance. Um, why do men we meet women at wells so often in Scripture? Why do so many things happen on the third day? Why did Jesus have to be crowned with thorns of all things? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you go on and the questions begin to multiply. What does Son of God mean? It seems it could mean a lot of things. What does it mean here? What does it mean when Jesus uses it of himself? Uh, and, and this is, so reading is more, as I said, more than just a coding. It's bringing together lots of information from a lot of sources and putting it together. And you, you have to have a memory that holds these things together. You have to be trained to remember. And as you do these things, you find yourself being trained to think and to reason mm -hmm. with what was originally the written text, but for you, maybe the preach text. Uh, now, just picking up something in the background. No, any pastors listening, I'm not suggesting that you folks should stop reading your Bibles. <laughs> we have Bibles now and we can read them. <laughs> we can That's read a great them. blessing. Yeah. This is a great blessing. Good luck yeah. meditating on the Word of God if you don't know what it says. Yeah, we are told to meditate well, and day and night. Not that is the great struggle is we have more Bibles than any other generation possible, yeah. and we know it less than most of them. Yes. Did. So clearly the simple presence of the physical <laughs> object does not make us more spiritual than others before us. No. Or more Osmosis knowledgeable. Osmosis doesn't more work. More I can't fall asleep on my textbook and absorb it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't even just, you know, do this, whatever they would call it, um, where you listen to something and it. Oh, like subliminal. Subliminal messaging. Yeah. Yeah. Where you like put headphones on at night and play your audio <laughs> Bible all night. No. It, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> Might have some weird dreams, though. <laughs> um, I already do. <laughs> so. Moving on. Uh, the children of Israel come out of Egypt amidst many plagues and this parting of the Red Sea and the destruction of Pharaoh and his army. And they're led by the glory cloud fire at night, cloud by day, to overshadow them and protect them. Along the way, God feeds them with manna from heaven. Uh, he opens a rock at the base of, of Sinai and lets a river flow all the way back into the wilderness so that they and their, their animals have plenty to drink. And he ordains a Sabbath day, a day of rest and of worship. And little by little, he gets them to Sinai. And it, by the time they get there, it's what we now call the, the day of Pentecost. Uh, and it's at this point that God comes down in glory and reveals himself and invites Moses up. Uh, and Moses goes up and down a couple times. Something to remember if you ever tried to calculate exactly how long it took for all this to happen. And one of the great uh, surprises to me was, oh, wait, climbing a mountain is not something you do in an hour. <laughs> uh, when, when it says Moses went up to the top of Sinai, that was a day. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And he was 80 years old <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah. So when you add up <laughs> And all... on one occasion, he had 70 people with him, right? Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So that that although they went, I think a little bit lower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Still yeah. a long way journey. Yeah. They needed to eat. Uh, and, and, and so in, in this context, as most, and, and this is something else I completely missed. And again, the, my complaining, it's chapter breaks as much as I love being able to find things in scripture. Uh, chapter 19 ends with, so Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And chapter 20 begins, and God spake all these words saying, I think I was in my thirties before I made the connection of wait. Moses, God isn't talking to Moses. Moses is down back on the ground. He's talking to all Israel. Mm. Oh, wow. No wonder they were terrified. <laughs> um, and although he would write these words on tables of stone, as Rachel suggested, most likely two copies, because that's what you do with receipts and treaties and things. <laughs> but they were still written on both sides, so that still leads us to the question of how they were divided by God. Initially, the words were spoken words that people could hear, two million people could hear, first um, sound system in history. And and so this is a good time to to start and to think about these, because again, as Rachel said, the Ten Commandments set the pattern for Exodus and for the Torah, the first five books, which are the beginning and fountain of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant book, and so of the whole Bible. And it's at this point that history is changed forever. We're going to talk about a God who is invisible, intangible, transcendent spirit. We're going to, he's going to tell us that his concern, although he institutes many rites and ceremonies and sacrifices, that his primary concern is ethical. He actually cares how his people live. The gods of the pagan world didn't really. Mm-hmm. They, they wanted to be fed. Beyond that, uh, any morality was, and we'll eventually, when when we ever get to Greece, we can talk about how Greek morality, such as it wasn't, um, kind of grew out of how they thought about the gods. But it wasn't because the gods said, do this. It was because, well, we're worshiping our ancestor, and he's in a plot of ground, so we need to keep the ground, so you can't steal my ground. And... Uh, I need to pass on to keeping a dear granddad to my son, so I better have a legitimate son, so my wife better not cheat on me. I can cheat on anybody, but she can't. And, you know, so there was a logical development out of their religion, but their gods didn't tell them to do any of these things. They just figured this is the safest way to make this thing work. Whereas here is God, the creator of the universe, uh, condescending to his covenant people and saying, here are 10 things that define me and our relationship and how you're going to live and what how you're going to live, particularly in the promised land. These are tools of dominion. They're revelations of my nature and ultimately the pictures of the Messiah to come. And, um, this, and so from here we can begin to talk about these things. It's um, when I would first started teaching two of my students, the Weasley twins, <laughs> um, came and said, well, we'd, we'd like to have a Bible study, largely because they both had girlfriends that they were getting serious about, and they thought maybe their girlfriend should study the Bible more, which they should have. And I said, well, well okay, I can do that for you if you want. What do you want to talk about? Well, you know, all kinds of things, just practical things, things we don't, we, we don't, we've never heard about. Like, like why the, the Ten Commandments? Yeah, the Ten Commandments. Um, why are there 10 of them? Why these 10? Why, why, is, why are these 10s more important than all other commandments? What, what, why are they in this order? I began to appreciate the question at the time. I know much better now what the answers are. I had some of the answers then. I've learned a lot more in the last 30, 40 years. But you know what? Those are good questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that both Christians and and certainly non-Christians come to these oftentimes and just say, God picked a weird bunch of things to impose on his people. There doesn't immediately seem to be a lot of, of coherence to them. Uh, none of them really, first of all, they're all, well, except for two of them, they're all negative, except for honor your parents and remember the Sabbath day. So a lot of them don't do this, not so much this is what you should do. Uh, it, it, a lot is assumed. We, we're supposed to know what murder and adultery and theft are, for instance, already. Mm-hmm. Well, something that just struck me now is how 
you know, we often talk about the internal nature of the 10th commandment mm. where everything else seems to be external about action until thou shalt not covet, which is about mm -hmm. the desires of the heart. But those two commandments that you just mentioned are also internal. Honor your father and your mother. Mm -hmm. Remember the Sabbath day. Yes. Can you check a box and say that you did those things? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's rough, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure I did those things somehow. Yeah, it's a general demeanor towards the person or the covenant sign of resting on the Sabbath day. But I mean, eventually Jesus will also tell us that these things are all things that we do first and foremost in our hearts and our minds and mm -hmm. therefore break the commandments there. But we tend to check them off as actions. Yeah, as actions. Um, and yet, it, long before we get to our Lord's Sermon on the Mount, say, we have Proverbs and we have the prophets mm -hmm. who bring us back to, now, what's going on in your heart here? What mm -hmm. you, you, It doesn't work that way. Um, and Jesus, in that sense, was not a revolutionary. He was just bringing them back to what God had always meant Although God, it, it in the first instance, doesn't here in the Ten Commandments does not expressly speak to the heart. These these are heart things. For instance, well, first of all, God announces who He is. Not that they didn't know, but it needs to go into the formal covenant document. I am Yahweh, thy God, I'm the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. He has already done this for them. They're they're not going to get out of Egypt by keeping these rules. <laughs> they're already out of Egypt. God brought them out. Yeah. He brought them out, we are told earlier in the book, because of his covenant, his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we've already talked a good deal about the Abrahamic covenant and the long-term view of blessing all the nations through the work of Messiah, who will grant forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Ghost. So that's all in play here. And if we make the mistake of, of not seeing that or saying, well, that was God's plan with Abraham, but now he's starting something brand new that involves getting blessed by obedience, of uh, the Schofield and dispensationalism in its classic form, then we're missing what's going on here. And as we read through the rest of the Old Testament on into the New, we will constantly be reminded that law keeping as a way of salvation was never God's plan. Uh, it, the law does something really great for us with regard to salvation. It shows us we need it. Mm -hmm. uh, it points out our mm -hmm. sins. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it shows us what God would like us to be like, but it can't make us that. It cannot change us. It cannot conform us to the image of Christ. It's a mirror. This is the image that James uses in, in chapter 1, I believe it is, who looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, being not a forgetful hearer. Uh, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. You don't pull the mirror off the wall and try to wash your face with it. <laughs> but while you're washing your face, it is convenient to have a mirror to see where the dirt is. And so this is one of the functions of the law of God. And there's, there, there's more. Um, but let's look at the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Uh, and a lot of liberals a century or two back said, see, this shows us the Ten Commandments as a relic of an earlier phase in Israel's history when Yahweh was simply the chief among many gods. <laughs> and here he's claiming not to be an exclusive god because religion hadn't evolved that far. That won't happen until Isaiah. Right. And, the, and the liberals say that monotheism was invented yeah. around the time of Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, that Akhenaten beat him by just a little bit. Um, because before me... Right. Well, that's not talking about rank. <laughs> it's not talking about rank. It's talking about where you are. Mm -hmm. Before me, it literally, is in my presence or before my face. Well, where is God's face? Well, there's two answers to that. On the one hand, you can say everywhere, and that's true. So don't have gods where God can. Don't have other gods where God can see them. <laughs> That'd be everywhere. The all-seeing God. That the one. Yeah, that one. <laughs> that the all-seeing God. But the other thing is that God's face, particularly as we as we find out in the New Testament, uh, in in John's epistle in the Pauline or John's um, gospel in the Pauline epistles, the great emphasis is that God reveals Himself in the face of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. God's face is Jesus. He's that's the, that's God down where we can look at Him in the eye, literally. Mm -hmm. And so as we come to God, uh, we we don't get to come. Uh, trying to juggle value systems. 
I have this value system for entertainment and this for marriage and this for my politics. And on church, for church on Sunday, I have this little value system that I've scraped together out of the New Testament and the red words of Jesus. God is the only God. It is God who defines right and wrong. It is God who makes the laws. It is God who saves. It is God who legislates. It is God who judges. That's the first thing here. Now, we often speak of idolatry. There are two types of idolatry. The first idolatry is that that Adam and Eve initially faced in Eden. You shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Who's going to make the rules for you? Who's going to decide what's right and wrong? Who's going to be your final authority? And God right up front says, look, I saved you. I'm your final authority. You cannot have other final authorities alongside me because then none of us would be final and of course, what happens then is it falls back on us as we choose among them, as we will. <laughs> we become the final authority, uh, doing a smorgasbord approach to uh, authority structures and worldviews as as is convenient for us. Uh, Greg, can I yeah. add one other little comment on the before sure. me? Uh, so the words there in Hebrew, alpine, are mm -hmm. the same words of the spirit hovering upon the face mm -hmm. of the waters in Genesis 1-2. So it's literally on or over upon my face is actually yeah. what they're saying. So it's not just um, me, but pretty yeah. much don't <laughs> don't smack me in the face with another God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to put it really that's, modern that, idiom. That, that gets <laughs> but to but it, yeah. it's important to realize that it's, yeah, right in front of him. Yeah. Uh, so th this for sure is Christianity, uh, Old Testament religion in its time, was exclusive. It literally said, there are no other valid religions. Mm -hmm. uh, how offensive, how arrogant, how, um, wow, it sounds like Nazis. They believe in absolute truth. <laughs> only, only Sith deal in only absolute truth. Sith, yeah. <laughs> That's where I was oh, going. Dear. I couldn't remember if it was, <laughs> it was Sith or Jedi. Yeah, the Sith. Only the Siths believe in absolute truth. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, your father was slain by a young Jedi named Darth Vader. Close enough. You know. <laughs> True. It, from it, a certain it's for point certain of perspective. View. Yeah. Talk about a, the greatest character assassination in yeah. all of cinema history. <laughs> Alas, Obi Wan Kenobi, we knew him well. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so that's the first commandment. The second commandment turns to a different sort of idolatry. This is the idolatry of trying to imagine for ourselves what God is like. The first, the first commandment says, no other gods. So the second commandment assumes that we read the first one, <laughs> not that we always have. Um, and then it says, all right, so we know we're talking about Yahweh, Jehovah, the God, the creator, God, the God of Israel, God of Abraham. As you, ta as you are thinking about him, as you talk to him, you shall not imagine for yourself out of your own heart. Notice that word, imagine. Yes, exactly. <laughs> What he's, what, yeah, because this is about making images. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can literally make an image. You can make what we generally think of as an idol uh, or a three or two dimensional. Three dimensional if you're uh, West, two dimensional if you're East, and say, this is how <laughs> God communicates with us. No, we don't really worship it. We just show it a lot of reverence because God contacts us through it. It becomes a talisman, a point of contact, a cell phone to the divine. Um, in the ancient world, they didn't think that their gods really look like, you know, bulls Mermen. or mermen, uh, ibis-headed two-legged men, whatever. Um, they knew that these were representations of ideas and forces that lay beyond, but they helped them understand their gods. They helped them worship, particularly once you made it concrete in the form of a statue or a picture. And you just felt so much closer. You could reach out and physically touch something that tuned you into the divine power behind mm -hmm. it. And so later on when we see... Constantinople and Rome defending icons and images with those very arguments. Mm -hmm. like, it's oh, this comforting. Is, yeah, it's, it's comforting. Everybody does it. it we, we show reverence to them because you're showing reference not to the thing, but to that which it represents and which is behind it. It's an aid to uh, spiritual... These, by the way, are the uh, defenses given at the seventh so-called ecumenical council. Uh, the last council of Nicaea, for the use of icons uh, in the church. And they're all horrible reasons. 
because they're exactly the same reasons that are given for worshiping idols that the pagan world would have given. Because they, you know, we don't we don't worship this image of Zeus. We worship Zeus through the image. Right. Well, are you bowing down to it? Well, yes, but we're we bow down to this, but it's Zeus on the other side that receives the bowing. But you're actually kneeling in front of a piece of rock. Yeah, but you you don't seem to grasp the theological subtleties. Well, I, I, God does. Um, <laughs> Can I tell a funny story about? Yeah, that? Um, a friend of mine who belongs to a church tradition that does not take quite so strict a view of the mm. second commandment. Um, you know, normally she's she's very sensible about this thing. You know, it's it's just a picture, right? Mm. But she picks up the church magazine or whatever it is that mm. had a so called picture of Jesus, and she was about to uh, make war upon a house centipede <laughs> with it. <laughs> and she saw the picture, and it gave her pause. And she's like, "I'm not sure why." And I told her, "This is why I don't approve of pictures of Jesus. God yeah. would not approve of you hesitating in this situation. That house yeah. centipede needs to die." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's violating your dominion. Take it back. I, I, I did ask my kids just a couple of days ago. So, if your Bible gets uh, worn out and and trashed and pages are missing, what do you do with it? And they knew what I was asking, but there was this momentary pause as they kind of looked at me like. I'm pretty sure the answer is throw it away, but that doesn't seem right somehow. <laughs> we <laughs> we can been... be like the Muslims and hold a burial service for our holy books oh, and they get I... their own little coffin. Yeah. You're kidding. I missed that. No. Okay. That's actually why they have some really old copies because oh. they were they were buried in special mm. little coffins and yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, at this point, you're turning the book into an idol. Mm-hmm. Which As, they do because which they, do. they can't put the book on the floor. They can't, the book has to be at the top of every stack of books. It oh, has to be yes. held above a certain point oh. because the physical book itself is, yeah, as you would say, basically become magical or yeah. receiving the reverence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good Aristotelian philosophy form becomes incarnate in matter. Yes. Um, but it seems like in all of these different places, even in the Western and Eastern churches, as they started to defend physical objects, it's because they had reduced the value of the word in mm-hmm. their services yeah. where they would say, oh, well, the people can't understand our services, but they can understand the images. They can't read. They, you know, the, all of those different arguments. So we'll just give them pictures. We'll dumb it down for them yeah. and keep it simple. Rather than, wow, what a great opportunity to start an educational program and teach all your people to read. Which is what the Jewish people traditionally have done. It's what the Puritans mm-hmm. would do. Scotland in the 1700s was the the most literate society in the world because they wanted to be able to read their Bibles. It was that important to them, and and that's what God's saying here. He he he's expressing it negatively rather than positively. He doesn't say, "Talk to me in prayer, listen to my word." He simply says, "Get rid of your images." And once we do, we realize, well, <laughs> what are we going to uh, do now? What are we going to do now? Yeah, I don't know. Once God told us, told us, oh, He told us, He spoke to us. Maybe you that's think how. You could maybe like speak to Him. <laughs> yeah, cool. and then maybe He'll speak to us <laughs> some more. Wait, wait, wait. That that book. Maybe we should. What, what what was in that book that we get it out of the closet? You know, let's let's find out what God. Set once upon. Wow, this sounds so relevant and like he's talking to me right now. When was this written? <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, I I must needs mention "Amusing Ourselves to Death" by Neil Postman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know the gentleman's personal biography. I, I know he had affiliations with uh, one of the liberal big mega church things, church, you know, uh, National Council of Churches or World Council or something like that. Uh, and he does mention that in his youth he was familiar with the Bible. He shows surprisingly more reverence for Scripture than a lot of pastors, and he's very critical of how the electronic church has has used the Bible. But he looks at this passage and says, "Look, this is about medium through which communication happens, mm-hmm. and the Bible is being and, and, and the Jewish religion is being absolutely revolutionary in saying that if you want to have a relationship with this God." You have to use words. 
which means you have to become literate, you have to read, you have to write, you have to study, and you have to write more about what's been written. And that's the only way this thing's going to work. And you're not allowed to fall back into images again. The second, the second of all of God's Ten Commandments says, the way of images is not the way of knowing God. And someone like Neil Postman, who's certainly not an evangelical Christian, as we would understand such a thing, let alone a Reformed Christian, he, he nailed it pretty good. He mm -hmm. understood that this, this is a turning point in the history of the world. The third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Carry it around in an empty fashion. One pastor said, use it in a cavalier manner. <laughs> Uh, and now we have to talk about names. Names. Now, the ancient world knew something of the power of a name, and we see this as late as the book of Acts when the Jewish exorcist tried to use the name of Jesus to cast mm -hmm. out demons, and it doesn't go so well. We, <laughs> we can think of the Celtic fairy traditions where somebody knowing your name gives them power over you. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Lord of the Rings, when the little hobbits find, um, oh, who, what's, uh, Fangorn, uh, what's his name? Treebeard. Treebeard. And they say, well, I, I, I'm Pippin and, and I'm... Mary. Mary. What's your name? Whoa, whoa, you're an awfully hasty folk telling people your name. <laughs> whoa, How terribly I forward. Don't <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, we'll get to names later, but you can call me Treebeard for right now. Um, uh, Tolkien knew what he was talking about. He was he was reflecting on exactly what you're describing. The names have a power. Now, names do have a power of sorts, even in a biblical uh, worldview, but not that kind. They're not mm -hmm. magic. And when we say in Jesus' name, that's not a magic spell. The the Jewish sorcerers tried, I adjure thee in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches, that you come out of the man. And the devils looked at him and said, well, we know Jesus and we know Paul. Who are you? <laughs> and turned on the guy and on the men and sent them running out naked. Um, but it we we are familiar in the West better with something called power of attorney. Mm -hmm. If you sign a check, the bank will honor it because that signature represents your wishes, your person, your authority. And if you have someone, if you turn over to someone your, your power of attorney, uh, then they can sign the check. They can sign your name. And if that's recorded safely someplace on some secret document of the bank, the bank will honor that too. Not because you're anybody in particular, but because the man who has the account has given you representative authority to act on his behalf. When God gives us his name, he's, he allows us to pray in his name, preach in his name, bless in his name, exercise church discipline in his name, exact oaths and vows of people in his name. This is incredible power within society. But again, it's rooted not simply in magic words, as if the very syllables of Jehovah or Yahweh somehow shake heaven and earth, but we're calling upon God who most certainly hears, because he's already made it clear that his face is everywhere. He's always at hand. And we're calling on him to witness and to enforce the promises and the commitments we're making. So now we have a society with a set and exclusive worldview rooted in things that cannot be seen. We have a society that is word-based rather than image-based. And now we have a society that is bound by covenant and contract, by verbal commitments explained in words. So back to words again. It's not just, you know, love him, love her, $3 kind of thing. It's, you know, they're, 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 this relationship, this covenant thing called marriage comes with words that tell you what you owe each other and how you, what, you, what you'd have to do to live up to this. Being a citizen of a country or of this country, say, you swear to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States. That's a big document, a lot of words. You're promising to defend the words in not simply as as um, phonetic sounds in the air, but as statements about rights, liberties, and authorities that the federal government, the state governments, and the individual people have. Uh, th this is a huge thing. You're, you're already, you're, you're pulled into covenant relationship, and it's uh, ugly stepsister contracts, <laughs> uh, which are 
which are a way step down from from that, but they echo it because mm -hmm. you, you you sign your name to a contract. You're expected to live up to it. Courts will enforce it. Marriage, by the way, is not a contract. It's a covenant. It's self it involves a self maledictory oath, and that's what we're talking about here. You swear in God's name. God's going to hold you accountable. So what we're already seeing is that in these commandments, God is not simply spitting out a few random, unrelated ideas. He is shaping a culture, a society, uh, a way of living with one another in light of who he is. And these are all mm -hmm. reflections of who he is. Uh, the, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We, we're not told explicitly that there was a Sabbath day before the journey to Sinai. There was a seventh day that God sanctified by resting, whether or not they called it the Sabbath or something else again. Mm -hmm. They may well have. But um, we're told in Nehemiah that on Sinai, God made known his Sabbaths, but that could be referring to all the other Sabbaths as the well. Holidays. The holidays. The, hol yeah. the Yeah, the holidays, the holy days. Uh, but certainly now we're, we're being told that the Sabbath is taking on a new significance and honestly new rules. Because mm -hmm. up to this point, there's no mention of executing anybody for violating the Sabbath day. But now the Sabbath is going to be the seal of God's covenant relationship with Israel and willful violation of it. It's going to carry the death penalty. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, because on that day, you're going to rest as a testimony to the covenant reality that you are in God's hands. Mm -hmm. You can stop working a day and the world's not going to fall apart. Yeah. Ooh, mm -hmm. that was huge. In a world where the common peasant was was struggling with nature, which were gods, you know, they, that is, they, nature consisted of a plurality of demons and, and demigods that you had to struggle with to get your crops out and you pleaded with them and you begged them and you bargained with them and you sacrificed to them, sometimes your firstborn child, just so you could have a good crop. And it's all on you because if, if things get screwed up, I mean, the gods are not all that nice. It's up to you. To, and they're to sure make not going to take any any hits for a bad year. <laughs> no, 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 no. So now we're being told, you know what? God's got you covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do expect you to work. This this thing of dominion. But six days will cover it, that seventh day. And in and, and here, there's not, the again, the explicit command of go worship, but it, it shows up elsewhere. Uh, when uh, in Leviticus, Moses lists the festivals of the Lord, the feasts of the Lord. The Sabbath is one of them. It was a time for feasting before God. That means worship. It's also called a solemn assembly. Mm -hmm. So you were supposed to get together with God's people, and you were to hear his word, and you were to worship, and then you were to celebrate with, with festival time, eating and drinking in the presence of God, um, and with one another. And this was a blessing. It wasn't, all right, but what can't we do? <laughs> Think of Laura Ingalls Wilder, <laughs> yeah. being forced yeah. to sit in a chair all day doing nothing. Yeah. yeah, which is where even today the Jews, as they celebrate this, they call it Sabbath delights, um, and they talk about the good things like wear your best clothes, you get three meals in the day, <laughs> and you get just. They have a couple other things, but they speak of it as Sabbath delight hmm. versus a Sabbath requirement. That's um, lovely. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing I was thinking is this in another way shapes culture because it's counting and it's structuring their time. Mm, Whereas yes. most cultures we know from chronology and things like that are very bad at counting and don't care. They're having to keep very close track of every single day uh, for this. And then they're going to be counting for all their different festivals. Um, it's emphasizing the importance of time, but particularly it's giving them weeks not just seasons of, you know, crops are planted now, they're mm -hmm. harvested now, it's cold, it's hot, mm -hmm. um, but rather every single day is significant so they can keep track of the week that the Lord's given. Not to mention the combination of the lunar and solar calendars, which is <laughs> a whole mess to sort out. Yeah, and but and yeah. you come to weeks, and I've, I've actually had, I had a student ask me this years and years ago, why do, why, why do we have weeks? The Bible. <laughs> No, no, I, I know it's in the Bible. Why do we have weeks? The Bible. No, you don't get it. I, I, I mean, why do... We... Look. <laughs> the Bible actually happened. God made yeah. a week. God created a week by using seven days in which to create and rest. And that was the first one. And Israel maintained it. And then eventually as Christianity spread over the world, 
the world copied it because it seemed really cool to have a day off. <laughs> oh. Well, it also shows how God's, God runs the world. And therefore, mm -hmm. when he says this is the way it is and we follow it, it makes sense. Yes. And it works. And things come out correctly because it's how he made the world to be. Well, in our first version of Halting Towards Zion, there is a uh, there's an episode called Sociology of the Sabbath. And I won't repeat everything that's there. You've already hit some of it, Rachel. Uh, we're looking at linear time that can be numbered. We're, look, we're looking at things that cycle, and yet every week is a new week, and the previous weeks are presupposed. That is, you have no, now gone to synagogue X number of times, and presumably you learned something, and you drew closer to God, and you're more mature. So although there's a cycle, it's a spiral. You're spiraling upward and forward to something better. The Sabbath itself says that the future can hold something better than what you have now. And ultimately, the Sabbath was a picture of Messiah's kingdom, of the world to mm -hmm. come. And they understood that after a fashion. And then all of the other festival days sort of fill in other aspects of what the Sabbath was saying. Um, also, to as the Sabbath came, you had to be prepared. You had to think ahead. You had to, okay, I can't... I was planning on doing this on Friday, but I can't because I have to be ready for the Sabbath. So I either have to do it sooner or I have to kick it into the next week because on the Sabbath day, I can't do this thing. Mm -hmm. So planning time, major thing. And every day is not like every other day. And there is this sense of sacred time. Now, in under the New Covenant, we don't sense it exactly the same way, but there is a Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we no longer have a holy place or a holy land or holy objects. We have holy processes like praying and preaching and serving the Lord's Supper. But strangely enough, we still do have a holy time, a day that God himself has set apart. And unlike the Sabbath day, which looked back to creation and back to the Passover and the deliverance from Egypt, ours looks backward to the resurrection of Christ and looks forward to the final resurrection. And so it comes at the beginning of the week rather than at the end. But it still sets for us some of these same things, that there is an order and rhythm to life, that the future can be better than the past, that some things take preparation and forethought, that work is not the end-all and be-all of everything, that, the, that life centers in worship, and that worship centers in the Word. Um, and again, if you want to go back and look at or listen to the sociology of the Sabbath, we develop this a bit more. Uh, I want to touch, I know we're getting near the end, uh, so we'll have to pick up the rest of them next time, but I, I want to do the one more for reasons that will become clear next time. <laughs> um, the The fifth commandment is honor your, honor your parents, but it's a little more specific than that, or phrased a little oddly. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God shall give you. A couple things. First, the commandment is addressed to grownups. Mm -hmm. We often think of this as a commandment for children. It is not. And Jesus made this very clear in talking to the Pharisees when they would break this commandment by not supporting their parents in their old age. He said, you're not mm -hmm. honoring your parents. Children are told specifically to obey their parents by St. Paul. But all of us are required to honor our parents. And that means honoring, first of all, our, our covenantal and biological parents, the ones who brought us into the world and, and, and raised us. But more broadly, our ancestors, our forebears, those who went before us in church and state, the, those who laid the foundations of our nation. And the uh, offices of them too. And the offices. Uh, when the law says more, on more than one occasion, so does Proverbs, don't remove the landmark which they of old time have set. That's part of what that is. The, the principles, the rules, even the physical boundaries that previous generations have put in place, we need to take very seriously. We need to respect them. Your old fashioned is actually a compliment <laughs> because what's the uh, what's the alternative? You make things up as you go. Uh, when I was a kid, we spoke of the now generation, but then someone came up with a button. Uh, we would say a meme. The uh, <laughs> the now generation is a has been because they found out the odd thing these these teenagers and twenty somethings. Guess what? After ten years. They were old people. They were old people. Originally, the, the slogan had been, don't trust anyone over 30. Well, that <laughs> didn't work very well, did it? That didn't 
age well. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but having told us to honor the past, particularly in the person of our parents, it says, so that your days may be long upon the land in the future. So this is a point of continuity. We look backward mm -hmm. and respect what God has done in the past, give our ancestors a vote as it were, as Chesterton would say, with a goal that we can, with those roots firmly planted, we can grow into the future and enjoy its blessings more firmly. A society that's rootless, to maintain the metaphor, is a society that's going nowhere. It, 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 it doesn't know what it's doing. It doesn't know what it's about. It, it, it fiddles away its time and, and self-destructs um, because it doesn't have any solid ground to hold on to and therefore has no, ch no chance of surviving the future. Uh, the we've old looked at, that is strong does not wither. Deep roots uh, are not reached by the frost. <laughs> and I can't remember the rest of the rhyme. <laughs> Something not, from not, the ashes uh, of fire shall spring. Uh, no, then something. not all those who wonder are lost. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. From the ashes. Yeah. The all crownless, that is gold does not get glitter. Yeah. And personally. the and the uh, the crownless again will be king. Yeah. So anyway, now that we've but, said the whole poem out of order. Yeah, it's out of order. But you know what <laughs> oh, we said? We said a very old poem, and there are people that are, who are listening and saying, "What in the world are they talking about?" Read an old book. <laughs> there are there there is wisdom in old books. This is part of what's going on here. I don't want to read old books. It's old. It's kind of, you know, here, I don't want to watch an old movie. What's an old movie? Anything that was made two, more than two years ago? <sighs> You're a child. <laughs> um, but with books, it's worse. Well, it's, it's, they, they use funny language and they're long. And, it's, and I don't have it on my Kindle. It's okay. for free on your Kindle. <laughs> guaranteed. Probably. Well, not that one, but yeah. many. Many are. Um, so we, we've seen here five commandments so far that tell us about the ultimate source of authority in a godly society, about how that authority is and is not to be represented, about the bonds that hold that society together, about the transforming power of worship and of hearing the Word of God, and finally about and how that culture will pass itself on into the next generation. And for those of anybody who's listened to us very long, you'll begin to recognize the five dimensions of a biblical covenant. But we're out of time, I suspect. We are indeed. Okay. We must conclude and promise to get to the next five <laughs> commandments next time. Mm. But until then, let's have some recommendations. Okay, well, here is, speaking of old books, this is a book by the Reverend T. Robert Ingram, that's I N. Graham. Uh, <laughs> it's called The World Under God's Law. It was printed or published 1962. The, um, the author, I believe, is an Episcopalian pastor. It was one of the first serious attempts um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s to actually look at the Ten Commandments and say, Here's their social significance. This is not a light matter. Here are some things to think about. It is not heavy, detailed exegesis. It's not something like, say, Rush Juni's Institutes of Biblical Law. It's more of a, let's sit down and talk about this kind of book. So it's, it's fairly easy reading, but it is very blunt um, in looking at what happens to a society that no longer is interested, even in the superficial nature of the Ten Commandments. What happens when you abandon marriage? What happens when you feel free to kill people? What happens when you will not worship one day in seven? Uh, good book, not very thick, uh, but you almost certainly would have to find it in a used bookstore or something. I imagine it's been in a print for a while. World Under God's Law. Cool. Which, of course, sounds absolutely horrible to people. You want the whole world to obey God's law? Better that than Muslim law, but people have trouble with that one. Because Islam's a religion of peace. <laughs> <laughs> with that, I will go next. <laughs> yes. I'm not going to recommend something by Islam, though. But oh. <laughs> um, instead, I'm going to recommend a book that I have used in teaching high school students in literature class, uh, which is called Lit. Uh, a mm. Christian Guide to Reading Books by Tony Ranke. 
And I appreciate it because he is very succinct and quick and to his point, uh, but he spends half the book establishing a theology for why we should read, uh, including where the place for imagination actually is, uh, because we do have a God, as he says, who slays dragons. Mm -hmm. And so we need imagination, but how do we use it? Uh, but then his second half is practical tips for how to learn to read, basically, mm -hmm. understanding that many people don't read or don't even know where to start, he goes through lots of different practical approaches and ways that you can learn to read and read lots of different things. Cool. Yeah. And I think I have that on my shelf and have not yet read it, ironically. <laughs> it, it's, it's a very a quick, quick read, read, I would say, overall. So, mm -hmm. all right, I'll have to get to that soon. Uh, I guess I'm going to recommend reading books to small children, mm. even if, mm. like, if you don't have your own, borrow one. They will love for you <laughs> to read. A, a to book or a child? Uh, both. <laughs> I, I thought you meant children, but I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, I've I've sort of accidentally started some semi accidentally, uh, accidentally started a tradition of uh, bringing books for my friends to read to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sometimes it's a really intentional choice, like this person's going to love this book. So I'm going to ask them to read it to Gretchen. Um, and sometimes she just pulls one out of her backpack and is like, read, please, read, please. And mm. then she gets to share some special time with a friend. Um, mm. And it's lovely. And no two people will read the same book exactly the same way. So it's it's always a new experience. Gretchen's just getting to the point where she will read parts of the book from memory mm -hmm. which is very fun mm -hmm. uh, just it's, be it's careful a good time because i had that as a child and therefore faked out my parents and my teachers that i could read when i couldn't <laughs> because i memorized the books and i memorized when to turn the pages mm -hmm. it took yep. them a while to figure yep. out i wasn't reading <laughs> you have to test with novelty gotta, yeah. gotta get the new <laughs> this is true yes <laughs> Yeah. Um, Her favorite right now is um, Your Personal Penguin by Sandra Boynton, which of course delights my penguin loving heart to no end. Mm -hmm. I still prefer Not the Hippopotamus, though. Oh, that's a good one, too. Yeah. 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 It, I don't think Sandra she's Boynton. got around to saying hippopotamus yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But penguin, she can say. Mm. Unlike well, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. <laughs> right. <laughs> she's ahead of a world class actor in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> well, before you sign us off, I don't know that we've officially acknowledged this, but I'll say it as the odd man out. I want to congratulate both of my co-hosts <laughs> on being with child. Thank you. We, give, Thank we you. give God thanks for this and look forward to meeting said children in <laughs> eight, nine, ten months, whatever it is. <laughs> Thank you very Hopefully much. Hopefully not 10 months. Hopefully not 10 <laughs> I'm not. I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> okay. You may sign All us right. out then. Thank you both so much for this conversation. As always, it's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks to you, our listener. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Please tell a friend about us. If you're enjoying our content, maybe somebody else will too. Um, and big thank you, as always, to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you, dear listener, would like to join the number of our financial supporters, join the ranks, uh, you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Thank you so much again for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>